Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. My pleasure to, uh, uh, to announce our, I think this is, seventh Anita Borg, uh, seventh Anita Borg Distinguished Lecture. Um, our lecturer is Radia Perlman. She is um, someone I only met relatively recently, um, but she is a legend in her field, which is uh, uh, internet protocols. Um, I, that may not be your entire field, I don't know, but um, anyway, she's certainly done a lot on that field. She is at Sun. She's a distinguished engineer at Sun. Um, she has written the book on bridges and routers and uh, Internet protocols, and uh, she's going to tell us um, how to, and I think probably the fun part, and not to, design a protocol. So thank you. Um, okay, so yeah, I, this is just, um, well, uh, kind of to tell you some anecdotes about, um, you know, how protocols came to be and to give you some pointers. Um, at the end, there's sort of this top ten list that kind of um, uh, summarizes the kinds of things to think about when designing a protocol. Because um, you would think that it would be some sort of science, but unfortunately it's not really done as, you know, a science. It tends to be a very political process these days, which is not necessarily the best way to design protocols. Now, first there's a digression that I threw in, um, and it's on this topic called tangible computing. And why, why am I talking about this? Um, well, partially because I gave a talk recently at which um, this was relevant. And I, I really liked the way the slides came out. And I, the, the audience really liked the topic. And um, it's a fun topic. And it won't take very long. So <laughs> this is about what I did in life before I did network protocols. So um, I was a system programmer in the um, um, MIT Logo Lab, where Logo was this um, um, programming language for teaching kids, you know, kind of all the um, programming concepts. Um, it was a language for controlling a little turtle, a, a little robot called a turtle, and you would have it draw pictures by, um, um, it, went, it had this pen, so when it moved around in certain directions, it would draw pictures. So it had um, commands like put your pen down onto the paper and then go forward um, a certain number of units, turn right 90 degrees, and if you did that four times, you would draw a square. Um, so I decided to um, see if I could teach all of those same concepts to preschool kids. So um, the first um, thing that I tried to build um, was called the button box, which was actually a sequence of button boxes where instead of having to type FD space 100, which really was a big impediment to a lot of kids, instead it was just something that was so obvious that, you know, the kids would be able to learn it. And so you started out with the simplest possible box, and then you could make a richer environment by plugging in another box. And then if it started getting confusing, you'd just unplug the other one. You'd be back to what it was before. So the basic button box, the first one they were presented with, just had all of the direct commands. Um, you know, put your pen up. Um, I'm not sure you can tell from... Um, oh, I don't know what I did with the laser pointer. Oh, here it is. Um, but, yeah, um, put the pen off of the paper so you won't draw. Put it on the paper, forward, backward, right, left. Turn your light on, turn it off, toot your horn. And so um, kids had no trouble whatsoever, um, you know, banging on the buttons and controlling the turtle. Um, so the next thing was um, you added the numbers in. So you had another box of buttons, and if you said five toot your horn, it would toot it five times, or five forward, it would go forward five times as much. And then there was the memory box, and the memory box had four buttons. Start remembering, stop remembering, do it, and forget it. 
So it was four buttons with, with pictures that kind of did as well as I could. <laughs> They're not wonderfully descriptive pictures. But when you hit Start Remembering, a screen lit up. And then when you said five forward, a big five and a big arrow would appear. Three toot your horn, a big three and a big horn would appear. Um, and then when you said do it, it would point to each command on the screen and do it. You could say five do it. It would do everything on the screen five times. Um, and forget it would clear the screen. So I went stop remembering just stops adding to what's on the screen. Well, it turns out that the kids didn't actually get this, the, the young kids. I mean, it, it was great as an introduction to Logo for anybody, any age. If they spent, you know, 10 minutes on this system, they were able to really understand Logo. But um, for the young ones, they seemed to interact with this in one of two ways. One is that they would ignore the turtle. They'd hit start remembering, fill up the screen with what were gorgeous icons. I spent a lot of time on that. <laughs> and then they'd hit forget it, and then they'd hit start remembering, fill up the screen. And, <laughs> um, and then there were people trying to work with the children, and so they said, um, um, look, we're going to teach the turtle to draw a square. So hit start remembering, and they'd try to distract the kids from the beautiful screen, and they'd say, you know, have it draw a square. Well, in that case, the um, kids would ignore the screen uh, and think that the program was the picture that the turtle drew and be totally mystified if when they were drawing the um, uh, picture, if they, had, if they turned the wrong way first or tooted the horn or something, they had no idea why the turtle was doing this um, because they thought they had taught it to draw a square. So uh, they didn't connect the set of commands with what it was that um, the turtle was doing. So the next thing that I built... Um, was, I called it the slot machine. So what this was, was that um, there were five procedures, and a procedure was this long plexiglass row that you programmed by putting commands into slots. And um, so commands were, looked like a credit card, where there was something machine readable on the bottom and a picture on the top, and you plugged them into these slots. So here's three procedures. Um, this button over here, if you pressed it, would say, do everything here. And this is a slot in which you can put a command. And the light here would light up if that's where it was. And so it would light up, read that card, do that command, then do the next one and so forth. And you had recursion and stuff because each procedure was a different color. So you could, um, you know, if you said red as the command, that would mean do everything in the red row. So, um, and you actually, um, you know, a command looked like that with a picture and some machine readable thing on the bottom. Um, but you could actually um, combine a command and a number in the same slot. So you could say three toot your horn in the same slot. And um, so this was reasonably successful. Uh, oh, it also had conditionals. Um, so in addition to the number, you could also say if you're hitting the wall, then back up or something like that. Um, so, um, anyway, so that's, that's that system, which was just kind of cool and um, uh, gave a chance for latecomers to come in before I talk about um, what the, I was supposed to be talking about, which is network protocols. So my current life, um, <laughs> I do network protocols. And I'll tell you some, you know, anecdotes about, you know, kind of my life in, in the design of networking that will give some interesting technical insight. And along the way, I'll also do pet peeves. And feel free to ask questions. And, um, and uh, you know, I'll end on just sort of a checklist of 10 things um, that I sort of came up with two days ago when I was preparing this talk. Um, so... First thing is robustness. Um, now, um, the anecdote I'll tell is that I sort of woke up one day. Um, I was, you know, young. Um, it, it was kind of my first real job. And I found myself to be the person that was designing layer three of DECnet. Now, layer three is the thing that does routing protocols and, and all that. Um, it's equivalent to IP. Um, it's just something where you have a network, and in order to inject a packet, you have to put an envelope on it with a source address and a destination address. And the infrastructure um, of routers have to talk amongst each other to figure out a path through the network in order to um, get it there. So um, what I started out saying was, okay, I want to do two things. Now that I'm in charge of layer three of DECnet, I want to make the addresses bigger, and I want to change from... 
um, one kind of routing protocol to another kind called link state. And the ARPANET had done that. They had, you know, the old one was called, I call it distance vector, um, and the new kind I called link state. So I said I want to switch to a link state protocol. And my manager said, well, I've never been convinced that those things are stable. If you can prove to me that it's stable, I'll let you do it. So um, given a choice between finding a proof that something works or finding a counterexample, I'm always better at counterexamples, and I discovered that indeed um, the ARPANET um, um, protocol, which I'll explain why, why it's the case, could be unstable. Now, you know, that means that if you, what, what happens was that if you inject a few bad packets into the system, it'll be down forever, never recover. And that's not a good way for a network to be, um, especially these days, because how do you debug a network? Well, you send management messages on the network. How do you, you know, how do you fix it? How do you diagnose it? And that's all extremely scary. It's like, um, you know, I, my phone <laughs> didn't work, and how do I call the phone company? So um, anyway, um, yes? Why does a few bad packets tie down, take down the network? What happens? Well, I'll explain, I'll, I'll explain that. I, I have some slides about it. It's not, you know, it's like, how could a protocol be unstable that way? And without the slides, I, so I'll, I'll get to that. Um, so, um, yeah, anyway, so I did write a paper about how it could happen. And um, indeed, it actually did happen. <laughs> And um, um, I didn't cause it. <laughs> and um, so in the paper, I said it could happen, and this is the way to design it to be self-stabilizing. Now, what self-stabilizing means is that once you get rid of the um, bad, the source of bad packets, once you get rid of the malicious node, you disconnect him from the network, the rest of the network should recover. Um, now, you know, like it's hard to believe you know, why wouldn't it recover? But as I said, I'll, I'll show you the example. Now, um, if you just did that, that would be really good. Um, but I'll talk about, on my thesis later, I went even a step beyond, which is to make the network continue to function while the malicious guy is sending bad packets. So, um, oh, and the way that I said to do it, by the way, all link state protocols these days, which are like ISIS and OSPF, do it the, the way that I had said you should, and they're all self-stabilizing, we hope. Um, but yeah, what, bad things may happen. So um, what kind of bad things? Well, some node could get its memory corrupted and get confused or, um, or just start injecting bad packets, or someone could do it maliciously. So um, you know, once the self-stabilization thing says that once you figure out where the bad things are coming from and isolate that. You know, don't accept any more packets from that portion of the network or whatever. The rest of the network should recover. So, yes? No, it was not malicious. It was accidental, right. And, um, you know, it was kind of ironic. Well, it, yeah, it, it did actually happen. Um, and their conclusion wasn't that there was anything wrong with the algorithm. They, you know, the, this was kind of the example of politics. Oh, well, I, I, I guess I'll be politically incorrect. Um, on the paper that I said, you know, it could happen, and this is um, how to fix it, um, I got two reviews, one of which said, um, gee, it's a very good paper. The other of which said, it's incorrect, badly written, it's not original, and the author's ugly. I mean, you know, like anything he could possibly think of <laughs> to say he did. And this was the first paper I ever tried to publish, and I got very discouraged. Um, now, I knew it was unfair, <laughs> and I knew pretty much who it was. It was, you know, the guy who had designed the algorithm who was feeling, you know, like... Uh, <laughs> um, but, um, you know, I felt like any routing paper would be sent to him, and so I'd never be able to get anything published. And you would have never heard anything from me, except that, as it turns out, the other reviewer must have been Misha Schwartz, who was a, a famous professor at um, Columbia, because a few months later he contacted me and said, by the way, you wrote this paper, and I'm, you know, using it in my class. Um, can you give me a proper bibliographic reference? I said, oh, it was rejected. And he said, oh. 
Um, and I said, do you want to see the review? And I showed it to him. And he said, oh, that's hilarious. Don't get upset. Um, <laughs> he said, would you like it published in this journal that I'm the editor of? So anyway. But um, <laughs> so after all of that, and then it did get published, then the ARPANET did die this way. And um, they wrote a paper about it. Um, and it's, it's like a detective novel, you know, how they actually discovered the flaw and how they fixed it, which is also not um, simple. Once you realize the network is in is wedged, like if it's your PC that's wedged, you power cycle it. Where's the on-off button on a network? So, um, you know, they, that, that was a hard problem too. But at the end of the paper, they just basically, they didn't say there was anything wrong with the algorithm. They said what they have to do is they have to make the routers more robust. They didn't have memory protection on the buses of the routers. So to prevent it from happening again, they have to build more robust routers. Um, Anyway, so let me explain how this could happen. What a link state protocol is, is where you, I mean, as a router, the only thing you can do, you, you know nothing. You just get plugged into this network, and you can only talk to your neighbors. So how are you supposed to know which neighbor to send it to in order to get it to Cleveland? So um, you only can talk to your neighbors. So the first thing you do is you figure out who your neighbors are. And that's easy enough. You just, you know, you're, they're right next to you. You knock on their door. You, uh, bring cookies over, whatever, and they, they'll tell you who they are. And um, so then you make up this packet known uh, that I call a link state packet that says who you are and what the state of your links are. So you say, I'm Radia, I have a neighbor Alice at a cost of seven, and a neighbor George at a cost of 14, and whatever. And this packet, you want to flood to get, you want to get it to all of the other routers. And um, so let's assume, you know, here a miracle happens. And so you send this packet to everybody else. Everybody keeps a, the most recently generated one of these link state packets from everybody else. And now you have complete knowledge of the graph. You know who all the nodes are, and you know who all the neighbors of all the nodes are. And from that, you can clearly calculate paths. So the only problem is this a miracle happens here step, which is how do you manage to get your packet to everybody else? How do they know what the most recently generated one? So um, regular flooding, um, where you just kind of send it, and then everyone who receives it sends it to everybody else, and maybe you have a hop count in there to get rid of it, that would be exponential number of copies that would get spawned when you send something. So that would be very inefficient. Plus, you wouldn't really know if you received two of them which one was more recent. Um, but here with flooding, since you're going to store the most recently generated link state packet that Alice generated, you know that you don't need to flood it a second time if you receive it. So therefore, it's only proportional to the number of links. So that's all good, except for how do you recognize if you have one stored from Alice and you receive another one from this neighbor um, with source Alice, how do you know whether the one you just got is newer than the one you have in your database. You might say, well, if it's different, it must be newer because I got it um, second. But no, it might come on different paths. So basically, I'm going to simplify the ARPANET algorithm. They had both a sequence number and an age. Um, and um, because the sequence number wrapped around, so you wanted to eventually get rid of things. But um, just for the purposes of this talk, just to give you some intuition as to how it could be that a network could not recover, um, I'll just talk about the sequence number. So the sequence number was a circular sequence number. And um, the idea you know, is just so simple and obvious. If you receive a link state packet from Alice, you look at the sequence number. And if it's greater than what you have in your database, you assume that it's newer, and you um, accept it, and you flood it. If it's the same or older, then you throw it away. So, um, but the issue is that um, it's a circular sequence number space. So it starts at 0, and then it gets to the highest number n, and then the next higher number is 0 again, and it goes around. So how do you compare two numbers in a circular sequence number space? Well, you take any number x here, and you divide the circle in half, and everything over here is considered to be less than x, and everything over there is considered to be greater than x. So then, um, one day the ARPANET didn't work. And the people who controlled the ARPANET were called at home. And um, 
you know, I'm sure that someone said, gee, the ARPANET isn't working. And I'm sure they said, oh, well, have you looked at the Grobnitz counters and, you know, whatever. And, um, um, you know, I'm sure they said, oh, well, but we couldn't do it because the ARPANET was down. Indeed, because the ARPANET was down, there was no way to diagnose it or whatever. Um, so, um, and these guys were really lucky, by the way. Um, never again in our universe lifetime will ever anybody be as lucky as these guys were. <laughs> because the ARPANET at that point was, um, um, I, all the routers were identical hardware running identical software. The people who had <laughs> written the code were the same ones who had designed the algorithm, and they were field service. So, <laughs> um, so that was the case. The guys who had designed the algorithm were called in to figure out what the problem was. And the first thing they did was try to look at the Grobnitz counters or whatever. I, I, I'm making up a word there, you know. And, um, and indeed, they couldn't get anything. So they rebooted their router because the entire ARPANET was controlled from this one router at BBN. And so um, they tried to... Um, 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 yeah, um, and they rebooted their router, and the same thing happened. So then they disconnected their router, ran diagnostics. It was running perfectly, brought it up again, and it wasn't working. Now, because they were so lucky in this case that they were the people who designed the algorithm, they were able to do a core dump, and they looked at the core dump once they, you know, attached it to the network, and they diagnosed the problem, which um, could be summarized as, oh, shit. <laughs> which, to elaborate, what they noticed was that the queues of this router were filled with link state packets from some distant router, let's call him Fred, with three sequence numbers, X, Y, and Z. Now, if you look at these three sequence numbers, X is less than Y, Y is less than Z, and Z is less than X. And so once it got into that state, it's not going to get out because every time you process one of these things, you're going to send it to all of your neighbors making more and more copies of it. So the more work you do, the more work you have to do. Now, they also had an age field in there, and so eventually you would hope that these things would get too old, but they never decremented the age because they only decremented the age if they held on to a packet for a certain number of time. But they never held on to any packets. As soon as they received it, they forwarded it out. So um, you know, the, basically, once it's in this way, the more work it does, the more wedged it gets. So it was never going to recover. So well, that's interesting. Now let's say that you're them. How do you fix the network? Well, you could tell somebody at every site to halt their router. Um, if Fred, by the way, what had happened was Fred was not feeling very well that day. And in his dying gasp, he said, I curse you, O world, deal with this. And he generated some link state packets with random sequence numbers. He was long since disconnected. Everybody in the ARPANET was running perfectly. But the algorithm itself was not stable. So how did they fix it? Well, <laughs> um, what they did was they came up with a patched version of the code that specifically ignored link state packets from Fred. <laughs> <laughs> and once they had their thing loaded, they told it to tell its neighbors to crash, which wasn't easy because the neighbors were very busy doing important stuff of throwing all these things from Fred around. Eventually, they would get something through and say, please crash. They'd crash them one by one. They managed to load every one up with a patched version of the code. And only after they got everybody could they then load them up one at a time with the real version. So, um, OK, so now the next step after that. Um, at the end of the paper, oh, yes? Well, no, they, the network sort of grew from them. So their node had the patched version. And when it, people would send it things from Fred, it would throw it away immediately. It would be able to communicate with the neighbors, not easily. But you know, after the 50,000th time you told the neighbor to crash, eventually it would process one of these messages. And um, then they would crash. You would bring them up. And once you know you and three of your neighbors, then uh, basically the network grows outward from there. But they had to make sure that they got rid of all vestiges of Fred before they could, um, um, 
you know, Fred's old link state packets before they could generate the uh, reload with the right code so that Fred could get repaired and brought back into the network. How do they put patches on the neighbors? Do the, do the neighbors automatically download the patch version from, from the uh, central router? Yeah, they had a way of, once you were crashed, of having a neighbor be able to force feed you packets. But, I mean, you know, this was an extremely slow process. So it, it, once they figured out what the problem was and how to fix it, it still took like a day. To, and the ARPANET was quite small. Imagine if this happened in the Internet today. We'd just have to say, oh, well, let's throw it all away and start over again. Yes? Uh, could you just go on the telephone and tell everybody to pull the plug on their router and just plug them in from the root node down again? Yes, if it were possible to have somebody on site everywhere and halt it, that would be fine. But in some networks, you know, there are some unpleasant locations like down in oil wells or up in satellites or something, and you don't necessarily have somebody there. Um, yeah. Um, so anyway, at the end of this paper that I published about, you know, this algorithm could become unstable and this is how to make it stable, um, which, you know, uh, um, is how they're built today, I had a sentence saying, this is how to make sure that operation will be able to continue once the malfunctioning node is disconnected. But you can't expect a ne um, network to continue to work while the malfunctioning node is still connected. And so um, I actually went back to, I, you know, I went back to graduate school after having worked for 10 years. Um, and so somebody said, you know, for a thesis, why don't you either prove that statement that you can't make a network work while the bad guy is connected um, or do it? And again, given a choice between proving you couldn't or just doing it, I wound up doing it. And um, it, it's remarkably simple. You know, it's like I was kind of afraid after I did it. Um, like the committee said, wow, you know, that's a really important, hard problem. Lots of people have thought of it. If you can solve this, that would be, you know, if you can solve any subset, allowing two nodes that are neighbors to talk to each other, even though there's a guy way out there, that would be enough. And so after, you know, kind of stepping back and looking at holistically, I realized, wow, it's, it's really quite straightforward. And um, it was so simple, I was afraid, you know, it was, they wouldn't consider it worth a PhD. So I kind of shyly asked somebody, is there any length, a, max, a minimum length for a thesis? And they kind of looked at me and said, well, it either has to be long or good. <laughs> so um, anyway, so that's what my thesis is. It's um, designing a network that has the property that as long as there's any path between me and you of links and routers that are working properly, will be able to talk even if all the other routers in the um, net are trying to be as malicious as possible. They can lie in their routing information about which links they have. They can corrupt, um, you know, when they're forwarding routing information from somebody else, they can corrupt it. Uh, they can flood the network with garbage. Um, you can do routing perfectly, but then not forward packets properly. Or, um, you know, all these people have talked about reputation systems where people gossip about uh, the reputations of routers. No, because the router can work perfectly well for everybody except me. And, um, yeah, it's kind of like the electric company. Um, we, the last three houses on our block lost electricity. And so, you know, I called it in. And then, like, the next day, they still hadn't done anything. And I said, um, you know, why, why haven't you come? And he said, oh, it's the lowest priority thing because it's only three houses. <laughs> you know, it's like, to me, it's all of my electricity. But, um, yeah. So anyway, um, yeah, the, the thesis is actually it's short and easy to understand. It, um, um, it's, yeah, and it's online. Um, so, okay, so the next two things that I'll... Um, talk about um, are making uh, routing more scalable with, with Ethernets. And this kind of leads into what, um, how bridges came um, to be designed. Um, and I'll talk about the spanning tree algorithm. So before Ethernet, um, you know, I, I became the architect of DECnet um, back when it was just a bunch of point-to-point -point links. And so the, the routers had to figure out paths. And then along came the Ethernet. And I said, oh, how interesting. It's a new kind of link on which you could um, have lots and lots of nodes. If you did the naive thing um, and assume that 
every one of these nodes has every one of these other nodes as neighbors, then the routing um, algorithm gets to be um, inefficient because the database and computation is proportional to the number of links. So, um, you know, I, I just viewed this as a new kind of link and that I had to rethink the routing algorithm. And so um, you don't want to have, you know, n squared links or n squared acknowledgments when you send something to a neighbor. So instead, I, instead of thinking of it as an Ethernet, as, you know, n squared links, I said, well, invent a new node that I called the pseudo node. And so you have one more node, and um, um, everyone just claims that they have connectivity to that node, which is the Ethernet itself. So, um, you know, that was all I thought of as Ethernet. But unfortunately, the world went crazy. It was one of these, you know, times when there was a big marketing buzz, and everyone was all excited. By the way, IP at this point was no one cared about it. It uh, was just this little researchy thing. So DECnet is equivalent to IP. Um, but, you know, the big commercial thing was DECnet. And um, so people were all excited about whether, which was going to win, DECnet or Ethernet. And I was saying, no, you know, Ethernet is a link in a network. It's not a network. And people didn't understand this. They really, the, the big question in all the trade reacts was, which is going to win? Um, and, um, yeah, I, you know, calling it a network confuses the world. I applaud the people who invented the technology, but I'm really annoyed at them for calling it a network. They should have called it a multi-access link. Um, I hate the terminology a lot. Uh, like, for instance, one of the other pet peeves I have about uh, terminology is Internet. What's an Internet? If you have two networks and you plug them together, you don't get an Internet. You get a bigger network. But <laughs> at any rate, um, <laughs> so um, people built directly on Ethernet. Um, so in particular, there was this group at Digital called, uh, building this protocol called LAT, Local Area Terminal, and they built it on um, on top of Ethernet. They didn't put in the extra header for, um, for DECnet. And so I went to them and I said, oh, you know, please, you should build on top of DECnet. And they said, oh, you're just upset because your layer is a dinosaur and we don't need it anymore. And I said, no, but you may want to talk from one Ethernet to another because Ethernet doesn't scale forever. And they said, our customers would never want to do that. <laughs> and so they, they did it you know, on top of layer two. They made a fortune for the company, so they were you know, big heroes. They would have made just as much money if it had been on top of layer three, but you know, management doesn't understand this. And um, similarly, in the rest of the industry, people were building things that ran directly on top of layer two, um, Ethernet. So why isn't Ethernet scalable? For one thing, the addresses are flat. One of the really genius things about Ethernet is that it comes with a unique ID, and you can plug it together anywhere in the world and not have to think about assigning addresses. Well, this means that there's no way to summarize a portion of the addresses with anything smaller, and so the, all the packet switches have to know about where each individual is because Ethernet addresses have no topological significance. Um, there's also no hop count. There, you shouldn't ever be forwarding packets that don't have a hop count in it because in case the distributed algorithm is in a um, um, you know, temporarily confused state, you're going to have loops and you want to get rid of the packets eventually. Now, this is something so obvious that I would think that you know, like, you can forgive the people that built directly on Ethernet, perhaps, but today nobody would ever design a protocol that's in forwarding the things without a hop count, right? Wrong. There's InfiniBand. And, you know, I, I finally looked at that, and it, the spec was, like, that long, so it was like, there must be a hop count in here somewhere. Um, <laughs> no, there wasn't. And I said to them, where's the hop count? Oh, well, uh, we didn't think we need it. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, there's also associated protocols like, you know, how you fragment it, how do you deal with um, uh, links that are different sizes and all that, which you wouldn't do if you think you're talking to somebody directly on the same wire. Um, so Ethernet was designed to be a single link. So um, anyway, so I failed in explaining to people why you need layer three. Uh, Ethernet kind of looks like IP. It's also an envelope that you have a source and a destination on. But it's not a good replacement for um, a real protocol. So you can imagine how foul a mood I was in when my manager comes in and says, Radia, we need to design a magic box 
that will sit between two ethernets and let a station on one talk to a station on another. I said, uh, it's called the router. And, you know, but I knew what he meant. It was basically, um, you know, we had all those devices out there that didn't have layer three in it. And the only way to get a router to forward your packets is to cooperate with it by implementing um, software in, in the station. So what we needed to do was build something that would do it without any help from the end nodes. So despite you know, their total ignorance of the fact that their packets were being forwarded, we had to figure out a way to forward them. So the basic idea of a transparent bridge is that it listens promiscuously. It's sitting on two wires or more. And on each one, it listens to all of the packets. And then um, it stores them up. And when the ether is free on the other side, or when it gets the token, if it's a token ring, it forwards it onto the other side. Um, now, it would also be nice if it could be smart enough so that when two stations are communicating over here, it doesn't forward it. And then you, the total amount of bandwidth in the world is, is bigger than, um, you know, because not, not all packets arrive on all wires. Um, so how do you know where stations are? Well, when you're listening promiscuously, there's a source address and a destination address. You look at the source address, and you say, if I received something from S on this port, that must be where S is. And then if later on you see something with destination S, you'll know where to forward it. Um, and if you don't know where the destination is, you forward on all of your ports. So this is the basic idea of station learning. Here, um, the, this bridge has learned that A is on that port, V is on that, X and F are on that port. It doesn't know the difference between X being on this one and F on that. It just cares that what's reachable on that port. It doesn't even know there's two ethernets there. So now if A were to transmit a packet with destination V, it knows it only needs to forward it there. If A transmits a packet for destination C, the bridge doesn't know where it is, so it has to forward it in both directions. This one doesn't know where C is. It will forward it in both directions. But if G, for instance, transmits a packet for F, this guy doesn't need to forward it at all. So eventually, the bridges pretty much learn where everybody is. Um, but loops are a disaster. So, um, and indeed, when this project was proposed to me, I tried very hard to get it killed. I said, it's too dangerous. Don't forward things without a hop count. Um, you know, make them put in layer three. Um, so the reason that I, um, it, you know, it's extremely scary to have loops here. Here you have two ethernets and three bridges. Now, if you ask somebody what happens when somebody transmits a packet here, most people think you wind up with three copies of the packet on the other side. Well, that would be not great, but it isn't as horrible as it really is. What really happens is that all three of the bridges queue the packet for forwarding. And then by the law of lands, one of these guys is going to succeed first. When he succeeds, these two guys think that the source is over there and that it's a new packet that they just got. So anytime anyone successfully transmits a packet, you have two more packets in the system. So there's an exponentially proliferating um, number of packets. So like with IP or DECnet, there, not only is there a hop count in there so that eventually you would get rid of these packets, but it doesn't spawn exponential numbers of packets because a router always only forwards in one direction. And when it forwards, it doesn't just toss it out onto a shared medium saying anyone who feels like forwarding it, uh, pick it up. Instead, you specify, Fred, you're responsible for forwarding it. So in general, there's only kind of one copy going around and there's um, a hop count. So this is, was like so scary. So um, anyway, but my manager said, um, that he wanted um, a spanning tree algorithm where the bridges would talk amongst themselves, figure out a subset of the topology that didn't have any loops. Well, um, he thought it was going to be hard. And, um, and so for some reason, he also thought he was being very funny. Um, he was talk telling me this problem on a Friday. And he said, while you're at it, and he thought he was giving me an impossible problem, he said, why don't you make it scale as a constant? So no matter how many bridges and lands there are in the world, the amount of memory necessary to run this thing should be a constant, So even if there's billions of bridges and billions of lands. Now, that's absurd. Maybe you could imagine linear. 
um, you know, probably it's going to be more like n squared or something like that. But, but a constant is absolutely absurd. Um, so then he goes away and he's unreachable for a week. And so, um, you know, I realized though that night, wait a minute, it's not only trivial, but the amount of memory and computation and all that is a constant, no matter how big the network is. And so um, I was, you know, I took a few days writing it out really, really cleanly, but I needed to show off to him and he wasn't around. So I spent the rest of the week uh, doing this. Oh, oh, yeah, so, oh, right, sorry about that. So, yeah, you know, what do you do about loops? Well, one idea is that you give up on bridges, and you say, oh, well, it was a promising idea, but I guess it doesn't work. Another one is what the implementers wanted to do, which is just to document the restriction and say you're not allowed to have loops. And I sympathized with them, and I was kind of a little bit um, um, feeling bad that it was being shoved down their throats because it – as simple as the algorithm was, um, it still made their device a lot more complicated than, than without it. Um, but, um, and, and I'll show you in a few slides how, um, yes, I felt good about it afterwards, that um, yes, it was the right thing to make them put it in. Um, and, but the other idea was to do this spanning tree algorithm. So, oh yes, so anyway, so um, given a few days of um, writing it out cleanly, and I couldn't massage this right up anymore. Um, I spent the rest of the time writing the poem that goes along with it. And um, the poem is called Algorime, as in every algorithm should have an algorime. <laughs> and what's kind of cute, I'm actually giving an invited talk at um, Lincoln Labs, where my daughter um, uh, works. And uh, she's also a musician. And they said, hey, wouldn't it be cool if the invited speaker was also involved in the, um, um, in the recital series? So I'm going to do a recital with my daughter. I play piano. And um, her brother set the spanning tree poem to music. And so one of the songs that we're going to do, she's, you know, an opera singer. So she's singing all these, you know, heavy Italian uh, things. In the, but she'll also sing this, which I will eventually have an MP3 of, um, hopefully, and can send it to people. Um, so here's the spanning tree algorithm uh, in poem. I think that I shall never see a graph more lovely than a tree, a tree whose crucial property is loop-free connectivity, a tree which must be sure to span so packets can reach every LAN. First, the root must be selected. By ID, it is elected. Least cost paths from root are traced. In the tree, these paths are placed. A mesh is made by folks like me. Then bridges find a spanning tree. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, yeah, basically you turn the thing on and it decides which links are not, um, should not be used for forwarding. Now, you'll notice, like, if somebody here wants to talk to somebody there, the path is not going to be a very good path. Um, you know, you have to go all the way around the long way. You know, it's sort of, uh, I, I'm not sure I've lived here long enough to be able to get this example right, but it's sort of like saying you don't need both Route 520 and Route 90. Um, you know, so let's close one of them down. Uh, you know. <laughs> so, oh, right, okay, so now, now I'll tell, so um, I felt bad about the um, implementers having to um, implement this. I, you know, I, maybe they were right that it, they should have instead built the dirt simple device and just tell customers not to um, plug it into loops until the very first bridge was sold. Well, the first bridge was bought by the most sophisticated customer that digital was ever likely to have. And so um, uh, um, they um, were saying, oh, you know, and they had this box of their network architecture, the, you know, with all these boxes and arrows of what protocols were talking to whom and this and that and whatever. And the salesperson was saying, I don't, it doesn't matter. Whatever you're doing, it's going to work. And they were saying, oh, we demand to talk to an engineer because they had to show them this fancy stuff of all this stuff going on. And they said, no, it'll just work. Well, they plugged it together. Their topology consisted of two ethernets and one bridge. They plugged it together, and it didn't work, and they were really angry. When field service went to figure out what the problem was, the most sophisticated customer we were ever likely to see with the simplest possible uh, topology had done this. <laughs> Because, you know, orange cable in the ceiling looks like orange cable. And indeed, the spanning tree algorithm was working perfectly. It said, 
I don't need to forward packets. I'll just wait around in case I'm needed. And um, <laughs> the only thing that wasn't happening was that packets were not <laughs> reaching one land from the other. So um, anyway. So um, recent work, by the way, is um, these days I'm trying to kill bridges and the spanning tree. Um, it was, you know, a hack, but um, I expected it to be temporary. It turns out that it's getting more and more popular um, because it was so simple. I, I, one of the things I want the world to believe in is make things plug and play. Um, you know, I have to know the name of the server on which my calendar is. And for some reason, every few months, they move it to a different server. And I not only need to know mine, I need to know other people's. And I need to know the names of the proxies. And all that. I shouldn't need to know any of this stuff. And um, indeed, one of the biggest compliments I ever got, I guess, was um, they did a survey of the major DECnet customers to see what they thought of DECnet. And the majority answer was, What's DECnet? <laughs> and that's how networking should be. Um, so um, bridges are wonderful. You just plug them together, and they work. You don't have to do a thing. Um, so people like them, and they build huge networks with them. But it is kind of an inherently very fragile kind of protocol. You don't get optimal routes. You concentrate the traffic and all that. And so I would like to replace it with something. I, I wrote a paper about it in Infocom about how to get the same transparency but have real link state routing inside. So you get optimal paths. You add a hop count when it's traversing the infrastructure and all that. Uh, so if anybody's interested, by the way, contact me and there's a whole mailing list. And um, now it's only politics sort of preventing it from um, going through, but politics can be a very large hurdle. The IEEE is extremely against it because it competes with what they've been doing for the last 10 years. For some reason, they love the spanning tree. Um, <laughs> but um, anyway, so now I'll talk about another topic, which is that when you're designing. <laughs> Right, actually, uh, I was also wondering whether there should be like an obligatory joke about being at Microsoft in the Borg series. But at any rate, um, <laughs> whether everyone has already said that or not. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, no. Oh yes. <laughs> right. I yeah. <laughs> I guess you sort of relaxed me over lunch, <laughs> all that wine or whatever. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, I do now, now that my return flight has been canceled. <laughs> um, no, th this is actually, um, when you're design the internet made a mistake of making the namespace, kind of giving it a monopoly to a company. And uh, you know they, they can't take it back once they do it that way. And the thing is, think about it beforehand. Rather than choosing the ideal company to be in charge of something forever, think about designing things so that at any point you can replace them with something else. So I will talk in particular about models for public key infrastructures that avoid monopolies. So what's a PKI model? Well. Um, public key is like when you're using SSL, you get a certificate so that you know the public key of the thing you're talking to so you can find out that they're, you're really talking to the right thing. So um, I will talk about various models of it. Um, so one model I call the monopoly model, um, which is um, that you choose one organization universally trusted by all countries, all companies, you know, whatever, you embed their public key in absolutely everything, all hardware, all software, and make everybody get certificates from them. This is very easy to implement, very easy to understand, but what's wrong with it? Um, well, one problem is monopoly pricing. You know, like the, this company should first give it away like crack, get the whole world hooked, and the more widely deployed it is, the more expensive it will ever be to have to rip the, it apart and reconfigure everything with a different key. Um, also, getting a certificate from a remote organization will be insecure or expensive. And indeed, you know, like I'm sure you guys are painfully aware that VeriSign was tricked into issuing a certificate with the name Microsoft.com with some public key that we don't know who has the private key, but it probably wasn't good because it was gotten with a stolen credit card. Um, so, um, 
that key can never be changed, and it's just good cryptographic practice to be able to change the key periodically. You should change the keys on your house every once in a while, just in case someone you loaned the key to made a copy or whatever. Um, and the security of the world depends on that one organization never having a corrupt or incompetent employee that can be bribed or tricked into misusing the key. So the next model is what's in browsers, and I call it an oligarchy. It comes shipped with 80 or so keys, and as long as the server presents a certificate from any of those 80 organizations, then you're happy. Um, usually you're allowed to add or delete from that set of, um, they're called trust anchors. Um, it does eliminate monopoly pricing, but what's wrong with it? Well, it's less secure. Before the entire security of the world depended on one organization, not having a weak spot where you could find an employee. Now there's 80 organizations, and if you can find one in any of them. Also, a naive user can be tricked into using a platform with bogus keys. Is it safe for me to do my banking at this airport kiosk? Why, yes, they're using 128-bit SSL, and no one's ever cracked that. But how am I supposed to know whether some previous user put in some really bad organization in there uh, for certificates and can impersonate the whole world to me. Um, also, even if I'm not, even if I'm using my own home machine, I can visit a bad uh, server and um, get this certificate, start getting a bunch of pop-up boxes about, gee, this was signed by a CA that I don't recognize. Should I believe it? Should I always believe it? It's like, sure, what are you talking to me about? Um, anyway. Even if you are a sophisticated user, how could you possibly check this set to see if it's reasonable? It's not enough to check the names of these trust anchors because someone could have removed VeriSign and put in another thing that they called VeriSign with a different key. So, um, and then another kind of interesting thing is why should these organizations be trusted? You'd kind of like to hope that you know Microsoft and Netscape or whoever sent you the software did some elaborate process of checking out these organizations uh, to see if they should be trusted. But no, it's just, you know, if you pay enough, you can get your key included. So, okay, so the next um, model is um, chains of certificates. So instead of um, needing a certificate directly certified by one of Alice's trust anchors, instead you can present a list of certificates. So if Alice has um, a knows about A, and you can present a series of certificates where A says this is B's key, B says this is C's key, and C says this is D's key. Now you'll know what D's key is. So um, now um, I'll talk about what the PGP, uh, um, the email, um, uh, pretty good privacy email um, model is. I call it the anarchy model. And the idea is nobody tells you who your trust anchors are. You, because you've met somebody personally and you trust them, you can figure, they give you your, um, their public key on a business card or something, you could configure it into your workstation. And so you have a set of trusted keys in your workstation. And every time you have a gathering of nerds, like an IETF meeting, you have what's called a PGP key signing party, where you exchange keys and certify each other's keys. And then there are these public databases, there's one at MIT, where anyone can donate certificates to. So if I want to, um, if I want Gwendolyn Smith's key, what I do is I look in my machine, and if I don't have her key, I can go search the MIT database and try to piece together a chain from one of my trust anchors that have been configured through a sequence of things in the MIT database to get to Gwendolyn Smith. So what's the problem with that? It's not going to scale. Think about how big it's going to get if you were doing this for the whole internet. Um, you know, if you had a billion users, each one signed 10 certificates. But even if by some miracle you could find a path that mathematically checked out, how do you know whether you can trust the path? So undoubtedly, um, you know, the vendors will uh, say, okay, we'll just leave that problem to the users, and they'll show you the chain of certificates. Should I trust this? Well, you know, the fourth link in the chain is where, you know, Dwight Jones certifies, you know, George Smith's key. How am I supposed to know? You know, my favorite example is where uh, Mother Teresa says, this is Charles Manson's key. <laughs> yes, I'm sure that's, you know, perfectly trustworthy, but should you believe when um, Charles Manson says, this is George Bush's key? <laughs> so, um, anyway, I mean, some of you are 
too young or not American or something, so you don't know Charles Manson was not a good guy. <laughs> um, so anyway, so I instead believe in some sort of name-based thing, where the basic idea is that instead of saying that a CA, that's one of these things that signs certificates, is trustworthy or not, you say that it's only believed for certain names. So there would be um, a CA on the premises of MIT, managed by playful undergraduates, and you should trust it for certifying names of the form foo at mit.edu, but not gates at microsoft.com because it would just be too tempting of a hack. Um, so the idea is that an organization, it's in their interest to certify their own users. So um, a lot of people think of this kind of idea as, you, yes, you have a hierarchical namespace. We all have DNS, and, and we're familiar with that. And you start at the top, and you go down. But we still have the monopoly problem here, because everyone has to start at the root. And so the way I would like to modify it is what I call the bottom-up model, where you have a tree, but you have links in both directions, where not only does the parent certify the child, but the child certifies the parent. And therefore, you can get from any place to any other place. And the root is not a special place anymore. If, um, if the root key were to get compromised, then I, as some user, you know, seven levels down in Sun's namespace, don't have to be aware of it. Whoever's um, managing the CA at sun.com revokes the certificate, puts in, you know, a certificate to the new thing, and automatically it takes effect for all of the users underneath. So, um, yeah, I, I won't go into this. Um, so the advantages of this is that in order to build this stuff within your own organization, you don't have to pay anybody to get certificates. You can manage all of your own certificates. Um, you don't need any outside organization for connectivity within your own organization. Um, security within your own organization is entirely in your own hands. Um, even if all the other CAs in the world got compromised um, and were dishonest, it doesn't affect what's, most, what's presumably the most security sensitive stuff, which is um, authentication between users and resources in your own organization. Um, there's no single compromised key that requires massive configuration. The only time it affects me is when the CA in the building, like when I got my badge, I got my key certified. If that one got compromised, I would have to revoke it and do mysterious stuff. But there's few enough users that someone can personally hunt us each down and help us through the configuration. Um, okay, so the next topic. I, I, uh, yeah, I'm actually almost done. So. Um, um, parameters. Things, yes? Um, you have contradictory to a single sign on, so in a sense, my trust relationship here is with Microsoft, so I'm carrying a key from Microsoft. Now, with my bank, Bank of America, I really don't want to be identified under my Microsoft relationship because that means that the MSIT guys could, you know, look at my bank account and so on and so on. So there's a total contradiction between one name multiple uses and multiple names, multiple uses. Yeah, let, let me answer that. Yeah, so he's asking about um, what if you have multiple names? And, um, you know, like he's not just John Smith at Microsoft, but he's also, you know, bank account number at Bank of America. And so, um, yeah, the way that I would answer that is that you are therefore two identities. The fact that it's the same carbon-based life form is irrelevant. Um, the name by which I know you implies who I trust to, uh, to certify your key. <laughs> and you may or may not use the same key pair for both purposes. But, um, you know, you're just, you're really two identities. So, so isn't it supposed to be like the password thing where I have two passwords for, passwords for my account? bank account, a password for this, a password for that, wouldn't it get into the personal insanity? Yeah, the question is then wouldn't you like have, have a lot of problem managing all of these identities? Hopefully you make it easy for the user. Certainly the user doesn't have to remember a million private keys. They can't even remember one of them. So, uh, you know, I, I would imagine some sort of, you know, wallet that you unlock and it will tell you all of your, uh, or, you know, you log in with a certain identity, with, with a certain name, and your smart card has all of the associated private keys with all your identities. You not, might have multiple smart cards. I have various credit cards that, uh, you know, aren't interchangeable. It might be nice to have only one of them. Um, yeah. Okay. So the next topic is parameters. Things should be plug and play. I, as a human, should not have to know anything. Um, I, it should just work. Um, but if there are parameters, it must be possible 
it must be impossible to set them incompatibly. Now, what, what does it mean to be incompatible um, in terms of parameters? Well, there's this protocol that um, I, I don't seem to be able to explain to my otherwise bright college-age son, which is that there's no such thing as a reliable I am dead now message. And so therefore, you have to periodically call your mother and say, I'm still alive. <laughs> and so now we have parameters. He has to decide how often to tell me he's still alive. And I have to um, decide how long it should be before I've heard from him before I call the police. And so if I think if I haven't heard from him in a week, I should panic. And he thinks it's okay to call me once every six months. That's incompatible. So um, <laughs> um, another thing about parameters is it must be possible to take a network and modify the nodes one at a time without bringing down the network. And so this was one of the things, you know, like when I designed protocols, I did it um, you know, in order to um, fulfill these. And I thought it was so obvious. You know, I didn't patent it. I didn't write... Um, papers about it, um, but it must not be obvious because people don't do that. So let me explain, you know, in the ISIS routing protocol that I did, um, in the messages where you say, I'm still alive, you say, expect to hear from me every 23 seconds. And, um, and so your neighbor adjusts its listen time to what you reported as your, um, how frequently you'll send the messages. Seems pretty simple. Um, but OSPF, which was a similar protocol that was built later and mostly copied ISIS, um, but you know, it was like a not invented here kind of thing, we have to do our own thing. They noticed in the fields saying what your parameters are. But what they did with it was they said, if your parameter is not identical to your neighbor's, you refuse to talk. So if you say, hi, I send hellos every 23 seconds, and you're configured to send them every 35 seconds, you refuse to talk. So, you know, right. Um, now, with bridges, it turns out the spanning tree has some um, um, parameters that kind of everybody has to agree on. And you would think that would be very hard to be able to manage nodes one at a time. But the way that it works in the spanning tree is that there's one guy who gets to be the root. And he and his message that eventually goes through to the tree to everybody reports what values you should use for the parameters. If you manage any, any other node and tell him what you want his parameters to be, all he does is save them in stable storage. So in case he ever gets elected, then he gets to um, uh, tell everybody what the value of the parameters are. And then everyone's using the same values, and so it can't be incompatible. OK, um, another thing I'll, I'll rave about. Um, is um, version numbers. This was another thing that was just too obvious to me to ever think that one should write a paper about it. What's a version number? There's all these um, protocols that have a version number in it. Like, for instance, we're going from IPv4 to IPv6. So there was a version 4 and then a version 6. And you might think, what happened to 5? But, well, um, <laughs> um, so um, what is the difference between a, proto a new protocol and a new version of an old protocol. So, well, um, there, this is not a well-defined thing. If you took your house and replaced every single piece of wood one by one, is it still the same house? Um, the, the real kind of definition of it is that at the layer below that says what kind of packet it is, can you use the same value before? Can you still say that it's IP? And if so, then you could say that it's just a new version of the protocol. Now, why would you ever change the version number? You should only change the version number if it's incompatible with the old thing, and the old one should not attempt to parse it. But, um, you know, so that's what we said in DECnet. We said that um, if there's a major version and a minor version, if the minor version gets incremented, don't worry about it. It's just kind of informational. If the major version does, you have to drop the packet because you wouldn't necessarily know how to parse it. It enables you to make incompatible changes. And then um, the guy with the bigger version can, once he discovers you're talking the old version, can do that. But if you're, uh, can, can talk your version to you. Now, um, if you're going to differentiate between things based on version number, the version number must always be in the same place. So you have to do two things. One is keep the version number in the same place and tell the old guys to not attempt to parse the packet. Well, 
Um, there's all sorts of protocols that just say, here's the version number field, set it to four, but doesn't say what to do if it's anything else. And that seems to be pervasive in all of the, the um, protocols that, you know, even today get designed. So um, um, the funniest one, actually, um, Oh, uh, yeah, there's, there's another trick that we did. Um, um, my co-author, I, I also wrote a book on network security with um, um, a, my co-author who actually works at um, Microsoft, um, Charlie Kaufman. And um, we kind of redesigned um, the authentication handshake part of um, IPsec. And since there's a um, potential um, security risk if you can get two people to talk an earlier version, like if you had fixed a security thing, what we did was that um, we put in a bit saying this is a version 3 packet, but I could support a higher version. So even if you negotiate down to thinking that um, you can have to speak the older version, there's a bit there saying we could have spoken a higher one. Um, but um, SSL was just hilarious. SSL um, had version 2 and then version 3. Version 3 totally redid all the packet formats including moving the version number field. <laughs> so you can't send a version 3 message to a version 2 node because who knows what they would do with it. And so therefore, when you first, the first um, message when you contact somebody with SSL, you have to speak version 2. And um, so <laughs> as it turns out, I mean, if you could say everything you needed to in version 2, why did you need version 3? That's just one of the mysteries of the world we won't worry about. But um, so you have to say it in version 2 format. And um, so the version, as it turns out, uh, version 2 is the most significant byte is 0. The least significant is 2. Version 3, the most significant byte is 3. And the least significant byte is 2. So version 2 node receives. Um, a packet that looks to it like it's version 768, and it doesn't even blink. It, you know, it just thinks it's, it, you know, why would anyone have redone the packet in an incompatible way? But, um, yeah, anyway, politics of networking, one of my pet peeves is that it's not taught like a science. It's taught like a trade school, where all you really have to know is exactly how to build an application to the Berkeley Sockets interface or something. Um, it doesn't teach you how to think um, um, about this sort of stuff in any kind of critical kind of way. You're told to, this is what is. TCP IP is what is. Um, as if it's perfect and, you know, whatever. And this is, and also you're not taught all the other ways that um, existed. And, you know, I would really like to reverse this trend and tell people you have to do your homework and all that. Um, and the committees are horribly political. So, okay, so this is my, you know, ten things that I thought I would jot down as kind of a summary of it. It's not a funny top ten list, sorry about that. Um, so, yeah, there's no such thing as a reliable I'm dead now message. You have to be constantly reassuring yourself about what the state of the world is. Um, you, robustness. There's also levels of robustness, and you should try to figure out what um, things you're really trying to solve. And people really ought to take into account um, Byzantine failures, where there's malicious nodes. These days, we're not in Kansas anymore. Uh, you know, it's not a nice place, the internet. And so, um, even though you can demonstrate in like some sort of peer-to-peer -peer application that, look, we have 10,000 nodes, they're all working great. Once there are guys that are willing to poison things, it's not going to work anyway. So you have to uh, uh, build everything defensively. Don't build in monopolies. Um, deal with parameters. Oh, exercise everything. This is a, uh, another kind of interesting thing. Every line of code, you know, should be constantly used. If there's a backup link that is only around in case the primary one fails, when the primary one fails, this one will be dead. Um, if there's a piece of code that only gets invoked when your nuclear power plant is about to explode, It'll be there for like 10 years. What could go wrong? Well, things change. And so even though you think it got thoroughly debugged, you know, the environment changed. And when you need that, who knows what it's going to do. Uh, one of the things that I find really scary is a lot of these intrusion detection systems that um, are like little, you know, minefields that are sitting around waiting until they think something weird is happening, and then they'll do who knows what. <laughs> and, um, you know, once there is an actual national emergency or something so that the traffic patterns change, just then these, these bright nodes trying to be helpful are going to be doing who knows what, and that just incredibly scares me. Um, 
do your homework. Uh, this should be a science. And this chip on your shoulder not invented here has got to go if we actually want quality things. Um, yeah, we're not in Kansas anymore. Um, simplicity. Oh, yeah. I, it seems like nobody designs protocols anymore. I like protocols, where a protocol says, this is the problem we're trying to solve. These are the messages we're going to send. This is what's in the message. Um, but it seems like instead the vogue is to design what I call a meta-architectural framework, where the committee meets for eight years, produces a 600-page document, which is content-free. And it's the architecture. And you know, like if you read through this document, it basically says, we're going to send messages, and the messages will have fields, and the fields will have parameters, and they go home and declare victory. And then you can build some sort of protocol within this framework or whatever, and things just get hopelessly complicated and inefficient when you have layers upon layers. Um, Ah, okay, and then this is the last anecdote, um, which is you should know what problem you're solving. And a lot of the things that I've done, basically everything I've ever done, you know, once you look at it, you say, gee, any 12-year-old could have done that. And, um, you know, because it's like really simple. Um, but, you know, it's sort of like first I kind of take a step back and try to figure out exactly what it is I'm trying to solve rather than what's kind of a problem in the industry where people get all excited and work on this little piece and work on that little piece and doesn't do quite the right thing and they add warts. And, and then there's this big, glorious, incredibly complicated thing that nobody can understand anymore, so it, it must be great. Um, so um, you know, the, the anecdote that I have, um, the last chapter in, in the book, um, Interconnections, which is my bridge and router thing, I have kind of the folklore of how to design protocols. And I have these little boxes that I call real world protocols. So for instance, the wine glass clicking protocol is n squared and things like that. Uh, but the real world protocol, uh, the real world example that will illustrate to you and you will remember for the rest of your lives why you should know what problem you're trying to solve before you try to solve it, is that when my son was three, I saw him in the hall crying, holding up his hand, saying, my hand, my hand. So I took it and I kissed it a few times. What's the matter, honey? Did you hurt it? And he said, no, I got pee on it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>mean by politics? Is it corporate interests or is it personal interest? It's probably some of um, both, but I think actually the more dangerous stuff is kind of the personal egos. You know, because corporate interests, at least they probably want something to work. Um, but yeah, it's, um, I mean, it's just really ugly. I mean, if there's a, a group of people who've been designing something for 10 years, probably they're on the wrong track. And there's no way to move them off of that track. Because first of all, they've invested 10 years. The stuff is so complicated, only they can understand it. If anyone else tries to kind of look at it with fresh eyes, they're um, you know, attacked personally. And um, you know, this is not a good way to design protocols. I always believe that if you can't explain what you're doing, very simply to an outsider, you, know, you can't say, I'm too big and important to uh, bother doing that. You should be doing that all the time. You should always be figuring out how to explain it. You should always be figuring out how to answer really basic questions. Why was it that you did such and such? And realize you might actually be wrong on things. Yeah. Yes? Regarding new protocols versus next version, uh, according to e this definition, like IPv6 would be kind of a new protocol rather than absolutely IPv6 because Ethernet type is supposed to be different. Yes, I IPv6. Yeah, oh, yeah, re re yeah. So the question is: Is IPv6 a new protocol or is it a new version of IP? Now. Um, what they were trying to say was, oh, you know, the, the um, people were saying, why don't you replace, in 92 they were saying, replace it with ISO's version, which had 20 byte addresses, and, you know, it was all ready to go. And they said, no, no, that would be a new protocol. Instead, we'll do a new version of IP. Now, IPv6 looks more different from IP than CLNP, which was the other thing, did. 
But, um, you know, at least you'd say, well, there's a version number field there. Well, as it turns out, because the IPv4 specification did not say throw away a packet if you see a different version, you can't send it a version 6 packet because an IPv4 node will ignore the version number field and try to parse it, and it's totally different. So, indeed, the layer 2 address um, the, the discriminator had to be different. So IPv6 is a totally different protocol. And um, why do you have to put 6 into IPv6? Well, because it's called IPv6, so they have to put a 6 someplace. Yeah. <laughs> yes? Uh, talking about uh, protocol standards and politics, how is, how is it possible to uh, adopt a protocol as a standard? How did you know, routing the Internet became standardized. How do you convince, how do people get convinced to all use the same protocol? Yeah, right. The question is how do you figure, uh, how do you work the politics? And I mean, I, I successfully got a bunch of things into the internet, but the spanning tree algorithm, link state routing, because I did them while I was at DEC and that was where networking was happening. These days, you know, it, it's much more political and there isn't any good answer to how you do it. Um, you know, it, there, there's a whole process, but in general, um, there, there's a lot of committees that, um, you know, for instance, <laughs> okay, to be politically incorrect, if I were to go to IEEE and say, here's an improvement to the spanning tree, um, they would say, what do you know? You haven't been going to the me meetings for the last 20 years. <laughs> we don't have time to deal with people like you. And they, the guy who's head of that has actually, you know, said that. You know, there's a bunch of people on the committee that were like, oh, wow, Rady is actually willing to help us. This is great. And he was saying, no, you know, she's an outsider. <laughs> so it's, it's really very scary. Actually, um, I, at the um, IETF, I sort of got there were such incredibly ugly things going on that I um, wanted to do um, at the plenary a talk called Miss Manners Meets the IETF. <laughs> and so um, I asked permission to do this and Harold Alvestrand, who was IETF chair, said, okay, fine. And I was on the agenda uh, for the plenary, but it didn't say what I was talking about. It just said my name. So um, then when the um, people who are the area directors found out I was going to be talking about this and saying, gee, you should be polite and it shouldn't be so political, um, they said, no, you can't let her talk about that. So I showed up and I was still on the printed agenda and I wasn't you know, going to be talking. So at the Sunday social, everyone came up to me saying, oh, Radio, what are you talking about? I'm so looking for your, forward to your talk. And I felt really stupid saying, well, I was going to say we should be polite to each other and listen and do our homework and stuff. But, but the, you know, the main guys here um, vetoed it. So um, <laughs> you know, I didn't know what to do. So eventually I found Harold at this social. And I said, Harold, you know, we have a problem. And while I'm talking to him, all these people are coming up, including somebody that said, Radia, I changed my airplane reservation so I could hear you talk. What will you be speaking about? So I smiled at Harold and I said, yes, Harold, what will I be speaking about? <laughs> so they indeed let me do the presentation. And um, it was very funny. I knew it couldn't be confrontational. It was very funny, um, you know, and pointed. And some people said I should do it at every IETF. <laughs> um, and it didn't offend anyone as far as I know. Um, but uh, to give you an example of a um, piece of it, um, one of the slides was, um, you know, like there was this great book saying everything I needed to know I learned in kindergarten. You know, share your toys, say you're sorry if you hurt somebody, take a break in the afternoon for cookies. And I said, oh yeah, we do that one, but we have to work on the others. And I said, unfortunately, in designing protocols, it seems to me much more like everything we learned about designing protocols we learned in junior high. Uh, <laughs> form clicks and be exclusionary, um, don't tolerate any nonconformity and, and this and that and whatever. So um, yeah, I, I, it would be nice to change the culture um, because, I mean, if the results were, um, you know, really excellent stuff, that would be okay. It just might be unpleasant. But the stuff is not very good. And if you look at the major protocols that people have designed, uh, you know, over the last 10 years in IETF. IPv6 is horrendously complicated and not as good in some very important ways as, you know, some other things. You know, mobile IP and, you know, all, all, RSVP, all these things that, you know, had all the hype. IP multicast, I mean, that's a real disaster. Um, is there any way that we can change this? I don't know. Maybe, stand, maybe committees are not, 
you know, I, I guess the right thing to say is, you know, democracy, you know, is the worst form of government except all the others. You know, so I don't really know what the answer is. <laughs> yes. MPLS is kind of interesting. Oh, yeah, the question is, um, what, what is MPLS and what do I think of it? MPLS is kind of um, an interesting thing. It's where you um, create a path. You create state in the path. And instead of routing based on the IP header, there's this shorter thing that you route based on. Um, now, it looks very much like ATM. And one of the things that annoys me is that after years of the IETF sneering at ATM and saying everybody involved in that are total morons and everything about that is wrong, 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 they basically adopt it and call it something else. But at any rate, the other thing that I find ironic about it is that it was invented for a totally different reason. It was invented because Cisco couldn't route packets fast enough based on the IP header. So instead, they were putting in this other thing to make the routers make a faster decision. Well, as it turns out, there's no reason why you can't forward based on the IP header at wire speeds. But MPLS turned out to be useful for a totally different reason, which is traffic engineering. Instead of what traditionally IP does, which is forward every router independently decides hop by hop how to forward it, Instead, you can set up an entire path. So you can decide that um, this customer gets to use these links and uh, you'll keep it free of the riffraff. And this customer use that, uses that. That's traffic engineering. And indeed, MPLS is useful for that, where um, you want to actually create paths. Yes? Uh, Protocols and intellectual property protection, should protocols be patentable, should they be protectable? Ah, patents. Uh, yes. <laughs> patents are destroying the industry. Um, now, I have like 70 issued patents, but they're like nuclear weapons because everybody else has them. You have to have them. Most patents are garbage. It's like, how can the patent office deal with this? I could be like the world's expert in something. If you gave me a patent, possibly even one that I wrote, <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't have written it. You know, I wouldn't be able to understand it. And you know, so my, my perception of how these things get done is that you write it up, and I'm a pretty good writer. And so you, know, I, you write it up really cleanly. You give it to a lawyer. He's required for some legal reasons to put it in a desk drawer and not look at it for three months, and then from memory <laughs> write something incomprehensible. <laughs> and then the patent office is given this thing. You know, they can't possibly be an expert in this stuff, and they're supposed to know whether there's prior art and whether this thing makes sense and so forth. There's basically no way to do that. And so they do come back every once in a while and complain and say, oh, they think that this you know, spanning tree algorithm uh, infringes on this prior art of cloning racehorses. And so then your, your attorney says, how can he answer this? And it's like... If it were at all close, I might be able to say something. And you know, you say you, you rant at him, saying, "I have no idea what to say." He says, "Oh, don't worry." And so he puts a polite reply back, saying, "Yes, examiner, thank you for catching that. Very good. What if I put a comma in the fourth claim? Will this answer it?" And they say, "Oh, yes." <laughs> so you have all of these patents that you know most of them shouldn't have been issued in the first place. And so somebody comes up to you and says pay me $100,000 or else we can fight it out in the courts where you may or may not win. It's going to cost you millions of dollars. And, you know, it's just really, I don't know what to do. I mean, I think, I certainly think patents are doing more harm than good. Yeah, I, right. This on top of, I, I just recently, the Silicon Valley Intellectual Property Law Association gave me an award for being inventor of the year this year. <laughs> but, and I didn't tell this to them in those words. But uh, yeah, patents are a real problem. The big companies can just cross-license everything. You know, someone says, well, you know, I think you're cloning resources. You could say, well, no, I'm not. But look, I have this portfolio. How about if you go away and not bother me? I'm sure I can find something in here. You're infringing. But it really locks out the little guys. Yes? Yes? Oh, what is worth patenting? Um, you know, I, I don't know. Uh, the purpose of patents was, you know, to share technology. And it seems to be exactly the opposite. All these tiny little trivial things, you know, shouldn't be patentable, but there's, given that there's no way for the patent office to be able to um, cope with the volume 
I, I, yeah, I don't have a good answer for that. <laughs> oh, yes? Have you uh, at all followed the controversy about the caller ID, sender ID? One of the IEPF committees just saw the bank and uh, their efforts because my staff has had it on the subject. Uh, no, I, I haven't been. Right, okay, he's saying that there was an effort in IETF that got abandoned because Microsoft said they had a patent on it. And I don't know, we seem to be at Microsoft, right? So <laughs> why are you asking me this? <laughs> because it's sort of interesting that, that I mean, Microsoft had a patent but said, well, you're never going to like it for free, basically. And uh, the answer was, well, that's not good enough. Right. Actually, what, what I think is really bad is when somebody patents something, a particular way of doing it, where it's obvious there's 900 other ways of doing it, there was nothing particularly clever about this one way, but they patented it to prevent interoperability. And, um, yeah, I, we want the world to be as interoperable as possible. And you don't have to actually go out of your way to make it hard for things to interoperate. Even at their best, it's hard to make networking work. But, uh, yeah, so patents are, are not, I don't think, the answer. I think yes? one of the reasons for that is that there is a competing IETF standard, and, uh, and they want an open standard instead of the one supported by Microsoft. So on technological basis, uh, it looks like the protocol is more uh, compliant, more standard, uh, and more flexible uh, based on what uh, like Microsoft has uh, uh, provided in the center ID specification. Right. Well, it's certainly the case that the IETF, given a choice between something that's unencumbered and something that's encumbered, will choose something unencumbered as a, well as I think they should. And it would be nice if companies, you know, for goodwill reasons, would try to promote unencumbered technology. When they did the um, standard for the next, um, you know, to replace DES, part of it was you can't submit something unless you have no patents on it. Yes, yeah, free, yeah, you can have patents, but they have to be free to license. I, I don't understand this reasonable and non-discriminatory. Uh, right, what does that mean? <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure that it means the same terms to everyone, but I'm not a lawyer, and yeah, this is a rat hole. <laughs> yes? Yeah. But it certainly seems made it very difficult for two companies to collaborate in any way without first going through a very huge legal process before you can even have a discussion to see like you really agree yet. Right, yeah. I mean as he was saying, IPR is just kind of the a major focus of when people should be designing engineering, they, they spend a lot of time on it. I guess one last one question. One last question or comment for getting it. <laughs> yeah, he said that um, the reason that they say reasonable and non-discriminatory is that if you say anything else, you go to jail, and nobody wants to go to jail. <laughs> okay, well, on that note, let's thank Radia for a wonderful talk. And as if the talk wasn't...